All right. Uh, so just so you know, friends, when we do record, we don't uh, put the, the prayer request time as part of what we, we uh, officially record and put online. So don't worry about that going online. Okay. So as I was saying, Ecclesiastes, the great skeptic of the Bible, he's the one around the table of the chorus of witnesses who's smoking cigarettes and flicking the ash onto the table. Um, he is in the words of Gerhard von Rad, a biblical figure who casts his tents on the far reaches of Yahwism. It's a real open question about why the book of Ecclesiastes is in the Bible in the first place. Because his worldview is one that doesn't have a particularly prominent place for the covenant Sinai, or even really the exodus from Egypt. His is a worldview that might have been shared to some extent by Israel's neighbors as well as Israelites themselves. So why is this book that is so full of skepticism and pessimism included in the corpus of books that you and I collectively read as the word of God? Maybe it's because having just a dose of grown up, experience laden, skeptical faith is an aspect of what it means to be a mature Christian. I mean, look at the times in which we live now. There is an entire constituency of modern American society that subscribes to the strange and veiled, almost Delphic oracles of a mysterious figure called Q. That tells them that there's a cabal of leaders who are engaged in a child pornography ring in Washington, even though there's absolutely no evidence for such a conspiracy. And maybe if you're a little bit older and you remember the assassination of JFK, how many conspiracy theories are there about Lee Harvey Oswald not acting alone? In our world today, we live in the midst of disinformation on a scale that's really never before been possible. The internet has meant that the information flows that flood our attention are greater and stronger than ever before. But they also come from places more and more inscrutable. In a time like this, when there is so much bad faith information out there, perhaps this man who casts his tents on the far reaches of this great skeptic of the Bible has something to teach us. Maybe there is a place, a mature center, where we hold on to God in good faith, but where we are also capable of turning an experienced and skeptical ear toward those things that sound more like flights of fancy than revelations of truth. So I want to invite you, friends, this morning to step into the world of Ecclesiastes, to listen to the voice of the skeptic, and to ask yourself, what illusions does God need to disabuse you of if you are to be able to walk faithfully in the truth in such a time as this? Friends, will you join your hearts and your minds on this Valentine's Day.
Our call to worship this morning comes from the first half of the third chapter of Ecclesiastes. Prediger, if you're following along in German. Ein jegliches hat seine Zeit, und alles von Nehmen unter dem Himmel hat seine Stunde. Geboren werden und sterben, pflanzen und ausrotten, was gepflanzt ist, würgen und heilen, brechen und bauen, weinen und lachen, klagen und tanzen. Stein zerstreuen und Steine sammeln, Herzen und Ferne sein von Herzen, suchen und verlieren, behalten und wegwerfen, zerreißen und zu nähen, schweigen und reden, lieben und hassen, Streit und Frieden hat seine Zeit. Friends, in this time, in this season, will you sing with me our first hymn? Well, now, friends, I want to invite us into a time of prayer. And though we might have some experience laid in skepticism in our regard of our contemporary world, and even sometimes in our relationship with God, we know from the witness of scripture that skepticism does not necessarily mean a lack of faith. We remember Thomas, the apostle who on the morning that Jesus was raised, demanded to see his hands pierced by the nails and his side split by the sword and asked if he could put his fingers in the holes of Jesus's hand and his hand in the split in Jesus's side. And what we saw is that Jesus Christ, the very living embodied revelation of God himself, met Thomas in the upper room and extended his hands to him and said, see for yourself, put your fingers in the holes and know 
and believe. God comes to us. And when we ask God for what we need, when we, in true and sincere faith, tell God that we are trying to have faith, but that we need to see some sign, God reveals himself to us in ways that we were least expecting. And so, friends, in a posture of faith, an attitude of faith, in a God who is continuing to reveal himself to his people, I want to invite you to be in prayer this morning. How can we be praying for each other? What would you have us lift up in prayer? Um, hi, Pastor Kurt. It's Ushi. Yes, Ushi. I'd like to say a prayer for uh, my husband, Ignacio, to guide him during these last few months in his master's program. Um, and, you know, to, to give him the needed um, strength and um, peace <laughs> to complete it. Amen. We will pray for Ignacio as he rounds this final lap and uh, sees the finish line in sight. Thank you so much. Are there others? Yeah, I'm wondering oh, if we can... Oh, it's Walter. Go ahead. Yes, Walter. So no, I don't want to run. Well, just I read some information about Yemen again. It's horrible. Just pray for the children of Yemen. There's many are facing mass starvation. And you know, it's the poorest country in the Middle East. So pray for the situation in Yemen. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, and thank you for not letting us forget about them. Um, we will keep the children of Yemen in our prayers this morning. Thank you. Thanks. And, and Katie, Thanks. you were, you were going to say. Oh, I was just going to say, pray for Carol, our neighbor with her heart condition, and then pray for Kelsey's dad. Thank you. We will keep Carol and, uh, and Kelsey and her dad in our prayers this morning. Thank you. Are there others? I have a prayer request. Yes, Hubert. Uh, my good old friend from Berlin, he passed away last week. I'm sorry to hear that, Hubert. Yeah, Klaus Schneider. Klaus Schneider? Yes. Thank you, Hubert. Hubert, we will, we will remember you in prayer and we will remember, uh, we will give thanks for Klaus and pray for his family. Thank you. Thanks. Are there others? Yes, Irini. Pray for our own country, for a peace and for favorable solution of what's going on right now in that impeachment of trial. I think that's a good prayer. I pray for peace in our country. Yes, this has to end what's going on. And we pray for that. Amen. Are there others? Yes, Pastor Kurt. Yes, Karen. There's a mother that I do parties for, and we should pray for her because she's uh, having ill effects from her chemotherapy. Mm. And, then there, and her name is Brandy. And there's another woman, she's only 35 years old. Her name is Cindy, and she's just been diagnosed with a uh, very aggressive stomach cancer. Um, and then there's a dog named, from, of a woman named Nilda, and the dog has cancer. Oh. And then we could pray for me too. What's the, what's the name of the woman who owns the dog, uh, Karen? Nilda. N Nilda's dog. Nilda's dog. Nilda. And I try to remember what Nilda's dog's name is, and I can't remember. And we will, of course, keep you in our prayers as well, Karen. Thank you for my continued improvement on my health. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Are there others? I see one in the text box, Pastor Kirk, from Josh. Yes, thank Valerie. you, Rishi. Yes, Josh and Valerie. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's see. Let 
Okay, so one one of uh, Valerie's aunts in Texas has tested positive for COVID. Mm. And so we will pray for her safety and for the safety of her, um, and for the safety of your grandmother, Valerie. Thank you, and thank you for seeing that, Ushi. Are there others? Yes, Bill. My sister Ruth, who was in hospital last week, uh, was in hospital for three days and then rested at uh, my mother's home. It's still there, but uh, she's well enough. She's going to be driving home to Escondido uh, today. Uh, she will have to take medications for the rest of her life, but the heart condition is controllable. Well, we will give thanks that her heart condition is control is under control, Bill, and, and we'll pray yes, for her. Uh, we expect good, good health uh, for my sister, Ruth. And we will pray for that. Thank you, Bill, for health and healing. Are there others? Uh, Pastor Kurt? Yes, Sophia. Um, just continued guidance from the Lord with um, the vaccine distribution and comfort for those who have already gotten it but are not um, doing well. Uh, a, a pre present company included, I'm asking? Not me, no. Uh, oh, okay. That, uh, my dad had a bit of a reaction. Oh my gosh, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Absolutely. We, we will pray for a quick recovery uh, for, for you, Roger, but also for all those who are, who are getting um, vaccinated and experiencing. I, I hear that the second shot is the doozy. So um, we'll, we will keep you in our prayers and we, we pray to you. Hopefully. Thank you, Sophia. Are there others? All right, friends, will you pray with me? Lord, on this Valentine's Day, we are reminded that the foundational truth of the world itself is your son, Jesus Christ and the love that he embodied for all your creation and all of your children. Lord, when we confer with our own hearts, as we watch the headlines, and as we fret about the future of our country and our world, we find in our own hearts not the the faith that we would have, but really only the desire to have the faith that we might. And so as we gather this morning, Lord, as we come before you, as we kneel before your throne, and as we lay our hearts bare before your altar, we ask that you would give us the faith that we seek. Give us the faith to trust in your resurrection one more time this day. Give us the faith to trust in the power of your spirit moving through your church to transform lives and to heal bodies. Give us this faith one more time this day. Lord, give us faith as we surround and pray for Ignacio. Give him the clarity of vision and the stalwartness of spirit to finish this course of study that he has begun. Bring him safely through to the other side and steer him, Lord, through the rocks of final exams and papers, the open seas of that time of waiting and grading to the safe harbor of graduation and his new career beyond. Lord, be with the children of Yemen 
and be with those, Lord, who are doing everything they can to improve the lot of these children today, tomorrow, and looking to the coming years. And Lord, all of the historic anger, all of the resentments and the hatred, Lord, we ask that you would reveal those things to those involved, involved as the, the poison and the, the, the continued fuel for destruction that they are. And prove to us again, Lord, in our own experience that your ways do not demand that we go to war, but rather that we love our enemies. Lord, we pray for Carol. We pray that you would restore her and that you would keep her healthy in the midst of this heart condition. And we pray for Kelsey and her family as they walk with her dad toward the shadow of death that ALS resigns everyone who comes down to it too. We ask Lord that as they move through this dark time, that you would walk with them that they would feel your abundant presence every moment and that you would take him safely through this last leg of his journey and welcome him into your arms for an eternity to come. Lord, we pray for Hubert as he is mourning the death of his friend. And in these coming days of loneliness that he will feel, we ask that you send your spirit to comfort him, even as you send your spirit to comfort Klaus Schneider's own family. Lord, we pray for peace in our time, real peace, not a passive peace that we wait for others to implement in our stead, but an active peace in, when each, in which each one of us regards our lives and our ambitions and asks not what we can get away with, but rather what is asked of us in this time. Teach us, Lord, to choose responsibility, to choose truth, to choose sacrifice for the well being of others, that we might find ourselves the very peacemakers that your Son Jesus Christ describes in the Sermon on the Mount. And in finding ourselves peacemakers, that we might be called children of God. Lord, we pray for Brandy as she is facing chemo. We pray for Cindy as she's facing a new diagnosis of stomach cancer. We pray for uh, Nilda as she is facing the, the sickness of her dog. We pray that you would buoy all of them up, Lord that you would move in their bodies and bring healing, that you would restore them to community and support. And that if it be your will, Lord, you move mightily and you transform this cancer, that it go away and that they be fully healed and restored to health. Lord, we pray for Valerie and we pray for her whole extended family whose name they told me on Wednesday and that I have subsequently forgotten. But we pray for them nevertheless. We pray that you that you heal her aunt and that you keep everyone who is a caregiver to her grandmother safe, that the family might remain healthy and stay healthy until the end of this pandemic. What do that you be with Ruth and with Bill and with their mother as they go on this uh, journey of healing and as Ruth is uh, walking out with, a, with a, a promising bill of health. And we give you thanks, Lord, for medications that do cure us of ailments that might have otherwise cut our lives short. We give you thanks for added time and added years. And we ask, Lord, that your grace would abound with this new time that she has. And Lord, we pray for all of those invisible people whose determination to work longer hours, to solve more problems, to see their families less, 
and to spend less time with their friends has resulted in this vaccine being more available than it otherwise would have been. Lord, we ask for patience for those of us who are waiting to receive, even as we recognize that this is the largest vaccine rollout in human history. Lord, remind us that those things that are new require patience in those of us who would see them to fruition. So be with those faceless, nameless heroes who will not go down in history, whose names will not be spoken on the news, but whose hard work and dedication are the real backbone of our common civil life. Protect them, empower them, give them rest, that they might make the best decisions possible and that this vaccine might reach as many people as, as quickly as possible. Lord, all of these things, we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who when his disciples, in a mixture of longing and doubt, asked him how to pray, he told them how to pray, saying, Vater unserem Himmel, geheiligt werde dein Name, dein Reich komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie im Himmel, so auf Erden. Unser tägliches Brot gib uns heute und vergib uns unsere Schuld, wie auch wir vergeben unsere Schuldigen. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöse uns von dem Bösen. Denn dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. meine Damen und Herren, ein paar Ankündigungen aus dem Rat, a few announcements from our, from our little church council. We are going to be building a community refrigerator station uh, to post outside the front entrance of our church. And we have a refrigerator as it happens. But what we have seen is that the initiators of the community refrigerator movement have developed a set of best practices. And one of those best practices is to build an intentional housing for the refrigerator. Now, if you're asking yourself, wait a second, are you talking about plugging in a refrigerator outside the church building? Indeed I am. We have a portico entrance to the actual front of our church on the corner of Glen Oaks and Kenilworth. And there is an entrance way that is heralded by beautiful trees and shrubs that hardly ever gets used. In fact, it gets used so seldom that when we're meeting in the building, we would oftentimes forget to open that door. But that's going to change. The front entrance to First German United Methodist Church is now going to be a place where the hungry can go, can open a community refrigerator and find it stocked full of food. If you would like to be a part of this project, a small gesture of hospitality toward our community, then I invite you to stay after on the call today because I need to consult with some of you if you have any contracting experience or contracting contacts so you can be a part of us building a little house for our community refrigerator that will live inside that portico at the entrance of our church. Next slide, Mike, if we can. All right. Here's my second ask. We are entering a time when, when we're beginning now to draw up plans for what our return to worship is going to look like. But as you can see, we've had a pretty incredible showing online consistently. And if you remember, when we did the end of Advent and Christmas Eve, we were able to put on a service in the actual sanctuary of the church. And we had cameras and sound that lent a particularly good production value to that offering. Going forward, the future is making church available both in person and by proxy online. The majority of people who find new churches don't find them by word of mouth, 
They don't find them in the newspaper. They find them on the internet. And they will oftentimes go and watch a service or two from the safety and comfort of their home because the internet has made us all introverts before they actually darken the church. And so it's important as a gesture of hospitality that we show the world what we get up to on Sunday morning and sometimes in our evening services. In order to make permanent that level of production value, that ability to stream our services online, we need cameras, we need a few new microphones, and we need not only a sound mixing board, but a video mixing board and a new computer. None of this comes cheap, but once we invest in it, the way that we will be able to tell our story to the world and to invite both our neighborhood and the wider city to be a part of what we're doing will be much easier. And it will be much clearer, I think, how we run as a church, what our values are, and what we stand for. So it'll be easier to invite people to join. So I wanna encourage you, if you were thinking about making a donation to church in this time, if God is, is convicting you to be just a little bit more generous and therefore live a life of a little bit more gratitude, then I would encourage you to go online and give specifically to our technology fund or to write technology in the memo line of the check that you send in. I thank you for your support and for your generosity and for the way that it is allowing our church to proceed with confidence toward the future that God is calling us to. I'm excited to announce that we are going to be getting steamy in this upcoming Bible study. We are going to be listening to the music of the Song of Songs, the Bible's great love text. And if everything had been perfect, the Song of Songs may well have been our text this morning on Valentine's Day. It would have just been, ah, but as we're stuck with the old and skeptical curmudgeon. But that doesn't mean that we won't try to make up for that this coming Wednesday. If you are wondering why I'm beating around the bush, well, it's kind of how the Song of Songs works because it is the Bible's celebration of sex and sexuality. And it has a very important message for the nature of holy intimacy. And so I wanna invite you this coming Wednesday at 6.30 to join us as we read this remarkable text in the middle of the Bible that celebrates bodies, that celebrates the erotic, that celebrates intimate connection and the depth of its mystery. And so if you want to be a part of that and learn just a little bit more about the Bible's sex positive attitude, then I want you to come and join us for uh, our study of Song of Songs this coming Wednesday at 6.30. And we will have a service of worship that celebrates this text. I'm sorry if our internet is cutting in and out, by the way. Um, spectrum is unreliable, as it turns out. All right. So um, I also want to invite you to check out uh, the Broken Middle podcast, which you can find here uh, following the, the uh, link in, in the description. This is a podcast that I am now uh, using to talk to leaders in the world of faith, art, and politics across the city of Los Angeles. And now I want to reach out to you. If you yourself would like to come on the podcast and discuss something important to you, you fall within, most of you at least, fall within a 10-mile radius of the church. And that's what I'm really looking for. I'm looking to invite people on who live within 10 miles commuter distance of the church. And I'm looking to use this podcast to put these folks on the same civic map with the church at the center. Now, if you're a member involved and you have something you'd love to talk about, I would love to host you. I'm not going to keep you off. But in particular, I want to use this podcast so that our church can get to know who our neighbors are and to introduce our neighbors to each other. Some of our neighbors, for instance, uh, work in homeless ministry downtown. Some of our neighbors work in the arts in the local scene in Glendale. Some have podcasts of their own, investigating uh, new music that's cropping up. This is going to be a conversation platform that helps us find out who we are, not just as a church, but as a wider neighborhood. So I invite you to, to if you have an idea or someone you think would be a really good guest on the podcast, please don't hesitate. Let me know and we'll 
hook that up and we'll feature them. And revisiting giving one last time. I wanna thank all of you who have been supporting the church and giving of your own um, prosperity. We really do appreciate it very much. Uh, it's what allows us co to continue to do ministry and it will be indispensable to the future of First German United Methodist Church. Uh, and we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the future over the coming weeks and different um, opportunities that God might be opening up for us as a church. So stay tuned. Um, but in the meantime, thank you very much. There are three ways to give online, uh, by mail or by text. Are there any other announcements for the good of the church this morning? Well, I'm just going to say really quick then, hello to Kristen, who is on Kristen's iPad and there with JJ, and congratulations about getting JJ's green card. All right, friends, let us continue in worship. say a big thank you to Gracie Garner, 
whose um, voice and power continue to inspire. And thank you to Sewan for her beautiful music. Our final reading this morning does come from the book of Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses nine through 22. Hear now the words of the Bible's great skeptic. What do workers gain from all their hard work? I have observed the task that God has given human beings. God has made everything fitting in its time, but has also placed eternity in their hearts without enabling them to discover what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there's nothing better for them but to enjoy themselves and do what's good while they live. Moreover, this is a gift of God, that all people should eat, drink, and enjoy the results of their hard work. I know that whatever God does will last forever. It's impossible to add to it or take away from it. God has done this so that people are ready for him. Whatever happens has already happened. And whatever will happen has already happened before. And God looks after what is driven away. I saw something else under the sun. In the place of justice, there was wickedness. And in the place of what was right, there was wickedness again. I thought to myself, God will judge both the righteous and wicked people because there's a time for every matter and every deed. I also thought, where human beings are concerned, God tests them to show them that they are but animals because human beings and animals share the same fate. One dies just like the other. Both have the same life breath. Humans are no off than animals because everything is pulse. All go to the same place. All are from dust. All return to the dust. Who knows if a human being's life breath rises upward while an animal's life breath descends into the earth. So I perceive that there was nothing better for human beings but to enjoy what they do, because that's what they're allotted in life. Who really is able to see what will happen in the future? So ends the reading. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we, your pilgrim people, hear your call to us from a new creation beyond any mortal reckoning, as we walk with you, empowered by your spirit, and as we sense from time to time the powerful presence of your son, Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead. We also find that rhythms in the world continue to abide. Seasons change and attitudes with them, but they come back and change again. Cycles move through our media, and our collective discourse. Elections come and elections go. The rhythms abide so strongly that in time they can come to feel less of a dance and more of a sentence. The same thing over and over never truly to change for the better. Lord, we would be your people on a pilgrim journey toward the future that you are calling to us from. But we would also mind the seasons 
and recognize that there is a time for everything. As we live and grow, as we gain experience and wisdom, teach us to recognize time, Lord, even as you continue to teach us to hear your voice. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is often a time in the life of faith when one has come through the sense that God is with us and calling us, that God is with me in calling me. There is a time in the life of faith when the pageantry of conversion or the confidence of a lifelong experience of Christian nature to wane. There is a time in the life of faith when the hymns begin to sound repetitive in church, when the scripture readings begin to sound like the stories told by older relatives around holiday tables who don't remember that they've told the same story many times before. There's a time in the life of faith when it begins to feel simply like a ritual, a pattern, a cycle, but that there really isn't anything new under the sun. In times like these, in times when we feel like we've come to the end of real growth, when we feel like we've heard it all before, when we stop holding our breath for the next revelation of God, in times like these, it is easy to feel alone in the church. We look out and we see that there are so many who are putting themselves to pains to keep the rhythms on beat, who do the work week to week to make sure that the slideshow comes to fruition, who do the work week to week to make sure that the notes are played in the correct order and that the notes are sung at the right pitch. Who do the work week to week to try to find something of truth to say about what God is doing in the life of the church, in the life of the world, and through the witness of scripture. There comes a time in the life of faith when patterns reveal themselves and it becomes challenging to see anything truly happening beyond the pattern. In times like these, the book of Ecclesiastes comes to our aid. It is the least represented book in the revised common lectionary, the least represented book in the Christian year. And when it does appear, when the editors of the church calendar who select the biblical texts to be preached every Sunday finally decide to give Ecclesiastes a little breathing room, all they let him do is sing his song that we sang together, we spoke together at the beginning of this service, the beginning of chapter three. There is a time for everything. A time for to weep and a time to laugh, a time for tearing down and a time for building up, a time for crying and laughing, a time for throwing stones and gathering stones together. We know this text, and it's a nice, beautiful text to sing around the turn of a year. But we ignore Ecclesiastes to our own peril. When we only listen to this first song in chapter three and disregard the rest of chapter three, not to mention the rest of the book, we lose out on the ability to hear a fully formed voice of faith 
that has somehow managed to weave the skepticism born of a tremendous amount of life experience with a humility about human ability to know the real ways of God. Ecclesiastes represents someone who has aged well, someone who has not let the skepticism that comes when our hearts are laden with experience become a pessimism or a stubbornness that stops others from growing and experiencing life on their own. But he is also someone who in spite of his experience recognizes that all experience is open-ended. That as much as we would like to be able to stand on our years as some kind of crown of superiority, to be able to claim the seasons that we have full up in our souls as something that gives us authority in itself. This is a soul that recognizes that experience does not add up. It does not come to some kind of crescendo or fruition. Experience teaches that the world stays open and that life goes on and that human beings frequently do not understand what they are doing. Walker Percy, one of the great novelists of modernity, famously said in an essay in which he references Ecclesiastes, that I am persuaded that modern man has no idea who he is, where he is going, or what he is doing. Ecclesiastes is skeptical. But he's not skeptical only about God. He's not skeptical only about the faith of Israel. His skepticism is an integrous skepticism. It is the skepticism that goes all the way down. Ecclesiastes is not only skeptical of faith, not only skeptical of other people, he is skeptical of himself. And that, my friends, makes all the difference. I encouraged you earlier in this service to consider for a moment the place where we are in our present history. We are at the very beginning of a new and uncharted digital age in which we can use modern technology to lift ourselves out of obscurity and to platform our voices in places where anybody with an internet connection can see what we've written or heard what we've said. We live in a time in which conspiracy theories abound on the internet and in which we have grown increasingly skeptical of the will of our fellow citizens. For all that the information age has promised, what has come with it that was unexpected in the optimism of the early times is a mutual suspicion that we have of each other. But what is in far shorter supply in this digital age is a healthy skepticism about ourselves, a healthy ability to look at ourselves and say, like Ecclesiastes does, what really is the difference between me and a beast? How am I so sure that my life breath will go up and theirs will go down into the earth? How am I so sure about who is righteous and who is wicked? This ability, friends, to regard ourselves with skepticism is what the great preachers of the early 20th century were reaching for when they talked about the importance in the life of faith of learning to doubt our own doubts. The difference between skeptical faith and immature faith is not skepticism per se, but stubbornness 
The opposite of faith is not stubbornness, or not skepticism, excuse me. The opposite of faith is stubbornness. Think about it, if you will, for just a moment. All of us are aware that the grand story of the Bible is the story of God pulling a nameless people out of slavery, giving them a name, carrying them through the waters of the Red Sea, up a mountain to speak to them face to face, commissioning them to go across the wilderness to a promised land, and then in the fullness of time, rescuing them from the terrors of other nations, from exile, from destruction, and then coming to walk in their midst in order to open up what God has done in their national history to the full experience of the rest of the world. Jesus Christ, in our deep regard of, the, of our faith history, he is the one who opens up God's plan, God's work, God's call in the world to every single person on the face of the earth. And yet, when we who call ourselves the people of God, who regard ourselves as the children of God, who make decisions about what happens in the house of God, when we sit down to discuss what we will do, when we come to church and commune with our own hearts about what God is asking of us today, rather than letting ourselves face the challenge and the uncertainty to face the discernment involved in the mature life of faith in which we do as best we can to make the most faithful decision that we can today and accept the consequences of our decision. Rather than facing this wide and open and wonderful and radical God whose spirit moves through us like a mighty roaring wind and takes us out into new and open spaces and builds new relationships and seals new covenants and makes a way where there was no way before, rather than trusting this God and following this God to the next stage of our common pilgrim journey, what do we do? We take a look at the finances. We take a look at the building. We take a look at those people who started coming to church. And in our own hearts, we decide that we are going to do everything we can to make sure things stay the way they are. Because at least if they stay the way they are, we will lose them more slowly than we otherwise might have. I ask you, friends, who is the more faithful? The one who sits on the wealth given to them by the past? Or the one who takes that wealth and risks it on building something in the name of Jesus Christ to give to the future? Who is the more full of faith? The one who looks to the past exclusively and demands that those who are coming after take the past in the same way and with the same level of seriousness? Or those who look to the future and who recognize that we only study the past in order to commune with souls who in their own time were looking to the future as it presented itself to them? We so often forget in the church when we regard the heroes of our own lives of faith, the heroes of our church past, and even our saints. We so often forget that we turn our hearts to them not because they were valuable and good in their own right, but rather because against all hope, we learn to seek the same things that they we're seeking to preserve a church, to prop up an institution, to hold back decay in order to keep the things that we like the way that they are, is not faith. It's stubbornness. Because really, 
Really? Do we really know what God is going to do? Can we really say with absolute certainty that God is on our side and that we stand in the right? If we commune with our heart of hearts on those few nights in the year and we find ourselves suspended in the midst of darkness, unsure of anything in our lives, can we really tell ourselves in those moments that we mortal human beings know what God is up to? If we can let ourselves grow skeptical of ourselves, we begin to grasp what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. If we can hold our own generational prejudices at arm's length and to take a second look at the witness of scripture, what we will see is that generations come and generations go. It is the living word of God and the choice of faith today that carries the pilgrim journey forward. Friends, God has made everything fitting in its time. And there are times when a word of faith connects and times when it will not. There are times when hearts will open up and receive something new and times when they will not. There is a rhythm to the seasons that abides, a rhythm to our lives that reveals itself in power. There is a constant beat. There is a cycle. There is a circle. There is return. But God has indeed placed eternity in our hearts. And so while for everything there is a season, there is also an eternity that yearns and cries out that can only be matched by God's own eternity calling to us from the future. To be wise is to recognize that life is mysterious. Life is not a problem to be solved. It's not an equation for which we're trying to find the right integers. It's not a balance sheet that we can make roll out in our favor. Life is a mystery in which we are involved, in which we do not see all angles in play, in which we do not have as firm a grasp of the wider context in which we find ourselves, not the kind of grasp that we would like. Life is a mystery in which we are involved, and therefore wisdom is not a matter of being right about everything. Wisdom is a matter of grasping our human lot in the midst of this mystery and trusting that God is still working out his ways in the midst of mystery. To walk by faith and not by sight, to heed the wisdom of this great biblical skeptic, is to be able to take a step out of our own immediate fears and prejudices, to be able to regard our own situation with some health, healthy doubt. How do we know? How do we know if we're being faithful or stubborn? How do we know if we're being wise or foolish? In the words of Ecclesiastes, there is nothing better but for us to enjoy ourselves and to do what is good while we live. The difference between wisdom and foolishness is in the fruit, is in the abundance. When we are foolish, we will consume what is good quickly and leave nothing for the future. When we are foolish, we will so insist on others hearing and respecting our story that we will never find ourselves surprised, enchanted, enthralled by the story of another. To live in foolishness is to live in anger and resentment. To live in wisdom 
is to make a level of peace with uncertainty. To live in wisdom is to be surprised at how deep and other and rich the perspectives and stories of others truly are. To live in wisdom is to recognize that there will be answers in this life that we will never get. And then, in the midst of such uncertainty, to stand and to rise and to follow God as best we can, nevertheless. If you ever feel a little embarrassed in the life of faith, if you ever feel like you're not quite sure what you're doing, if you look around and wonder what we're really doing when we gather together, when we set time out of our week to get on a Zoom call in the midst of a pandemic, then you are on the right track. If you ever grow skeptical about the church's true motivations and decide it's time for you to stand up and say what you need to say to make sure that we stay on as faithful a track as we can, then you are living a life of wisdom. And if you are capable of laughing until you cry about the preposterousness of your own ridiculous person, well then friends, the life of wisdom is already abiding inside of your spirit. There are cycles and seasons for everything. And at times it can feel as though there really is nothing new under the sun, that all that has been will be again, and that everything that will be has already been. But God has planted eternity in your heart. And so the longings in your heart that abound and pain you, even to this day, reaching out and asking if there is actually something more. That is a longing the witness of scripture tells us that God himself put there for a reason. Friends, we are about to begin the season of Lent. This coming Wednesday, we'll have a small Ash Wednesday service right before we have our Bible study. It'll start start at uh, six o'clock if you want to be a part. Um, Sorry to announce that, Mike. And we celebrate Ash Wednesday every single year as the start of the season of Lent, the season of the year that we set aside to mind Jesus's journey in the wilderness before the beginning of his public ministry. We set that time aside every year because Jesus's whole life is we set aside specific times to look at specific moments in the life of Christ. Because just like when we're taking in a magisterial painting, it's one thing to take a step back and regard the entire painting. But it is another thing altogether to get in close and to regard the composition and the disposition of a face, the, the, the demeanor of a gesture. We have seasons in the life of the church, that we have rhythms that we dance to in our collective life. But all of these things we do, not in and of themselves, not because they're wonderful and beautiful rituals, though they are, we do them because God has planted eternity in our hearts and attention to the signs of the times and the rhythms of the season teach us something about when new growth in faith happens, about when new conversations begin to open up, about when new space is made inside the heart to be more receptive than it otherwise would have been. We celebrate the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of the life of Christ, the rhythms of faith, not because the rhythms themselves are the point, but because the rhythms remind us that our God is on the move and that walking by faith is a rhythm that actually takes us closer to the future. So from a wide out perspective, 
Do not be discouraged if you find yourself exhausted by the rhythms of the season. Do not be discouraged if you feel like you've heard the words of scripture before. Don't be discouraged if you're starting to suspect that we've been here before and that there really is nothing new under the sun. Know this. God is calling you forward. And God will give you the faith that you need to follow. What has been will be again. And yet, as John's gospel says, no eye has seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. To live a life of wisdom is to recognize what time it is but to recognize also that we human beings are on earth, that God is in heaven, and that we have yet to see all who God is going to be. So friends, go forth in faith, skeptical of the wars and rumors of wars that we hear floating around on the internet, skeptical of a 24-hour news cycle that has to sensationalize everything in order to make money, skeptical of an internet culture that seems only to lift up elections, personality, and scandal. But in the midst of your skepticism, do not let yourself grow stubborn. Do not think that the church is yours that the resources stored up from the past to promote ministry in the future are simply resources you get to exhaust in your own life. Do not think for a moment that your bank statement or your calendar are not definitive documents of what you put your faith in. God is doing a new thing. God is giving us faith and calling faith out of us. As we enter the season of Lent, I ask you, what future do you sense God calling you to? And then I want to encourage you to speak up. I want to encourage you to say something. I want to encourage you to tell the church where God has put eternity in your heart and what you think the most faithful and least stubborn act for our community going into this season and beyond might be. Go in wisdom, confident that you don't know yourself as well as you think, and you certainly don't know God as well as you might hope. But isn't it better to have it that way? Isn't it better to serve a God who is not finished with us yet?
dann gehört dir unser Leben ganz. Our whole lives belong to you. What would happen if our whole lives did really belong to God and not to us? What would happen if we saw ourselves as stewards of our lives? Stewards who did not understand entirely everything about this gift we'd been given, who were called merely to be faithful, true, and just with this gift that we've been given. My sense is that we would be less haughty and combative about what we believe. My sense is that our whole community would be more hospitable. My sense is that we would experience transformation in our community on a regular basis, seeing the new and good things that God can do. So friends, I wanna invite you as we move forward Don't think you've seen everything. Be wise and discerning. Be skeptical of all new ideas. Interrogate them and make sure that they pass muster. But make sure as well, your skepticism is not a mask for stubbornness. Make sure that your skepticism is really what experience has taught you and make sure that it is coming from a place of real trust and faith. When we can hold these two things together, skepticism and faith, we will know in our own experience what maturity really is. I invite you to come on Wednesday, this same call at 6 p.m. for a small Ash Wednesday service to start the season of Lent, and then to stay as we consult the Song of Songs afterward. And now, friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to learn maturity in your own experience. Thank you everyone for being here today. It's been wonderful seeing you. Uh, as always, I'm going to bow out on this computer and go join Katie over on hers. But let's uh, be in fellowship for 10 or 15 minutes. And then if you want to stay uh, afterward, uh, we will start talking about our community refrigerator at 1215. So thank you everyone. And I bid you uh, adieu and tschüss. And I'll see you over on Katie's computer.